Whoa. I used to like Nima, but um, two things. He dresses better than me, and he can rap. Okay, so I'm just going to do some housekeeping. In honour of APRA and the Chiropractic Board of Australia, uh, the codes and regulations, we advise that all DCs present here at DG Congress throughout the weekend are registered chiropractors or doctors within their country of residence only. Throughout the weekend, you may be photographed or videoed by the DG Congress staff. Um, if you have any concerns with this, please tell us. And we want you to be sort of just, just you know, comfortable. We don't want any of these sort of red carpet ones. You know, with, um, just be natural. There are two doors for entering uh, and leaving main plenary, um, and they will be shut on the commencement of the um, scheduled uh, presentations. Um, if you are late, then um, please enter quietly, please. Uh, wear your name tags at all times. There will be staff that will be checking your name tags. Um, please honour the speakers by turning off your phones or putting on them silent. Any phone call um, that happens during a presentation, that's a $100 fine, which will go to spinal research. Um, the music you heard on the way is the Q music, so the Pharrell Williams um, Happy. So, so that's, the, that's the, the music that you're going to hear to call you into plenary and the sessions. Um, throughout my 15, 16 years um, of being chiropractor, um, this next speaker has given me so many hows, I don't know what to do with. You know, every time that he graces the stage at any, you know, any sort of um, presentation, he is full of hows, how to be a better person, how to be a great chiropractor, how to just love and serve better. He is the custodian of DG, Dr. John Hinwood. He's a co-founder of Dynamic Growth. Together with his wife, Judy, they now spend their life taking the chiropractic message of proactive health uh, care to individuals, families, and the corporate world, delivering innovative and transformational work in stress life balance and mindset change. Their work is engaging and thought provoking. They also have a great reputation with global leaders in stress management. Put your hands together for Dr. John Himwood. Thank you. I'm going to share with you three stories this afternoon. And those three stories are, are about how. How these three people changed the lives of millions of people. This first person is Robert Desnos. Robert Desnos was a surrealist poet in the 1930s. He was Jewish. And he was rounded up in Paris and taken to Auschwitz. Anybody here been to Auschwitz? Scary place. Would you agree? Those are at the, the luncheon, the speaker's luncheon, the team, team luncheon. Phil McMaster shared about vibration. When you arrive at Auschwitz, there's vibrations there that are unbelievably negative. Because when the Germans left Auschwitz in 1945, they didn't realise the Russians were coming, and they had to bolt, and they couldn't destroy the things that they'd created there. They're still there. And they've been preserved in a museum. Last month, you may have seen, it was the anniversary of 70 years for survivors of Auschwitz. And there was quite a bit on television about it. Desnos, in his group, here he is in middle, front and centre there with the beard. They were on a road game. They'd been worked for a number of years till it got to this. Here they are, skin and bone. The camp decided that they were no longer useful. Robert Desnos and his group walked out of the barracks this morning, and instead of the truck facing that way, the truck was facing that way. They weren't going to work, they were going to the gas chamber. Skin and bone. The how. How can you change this and not go to the gas chamber today? Robert Desnos was first onto the back of the truck. He got on and he ran backwards. He got down the end. First man, show me your hand. Show me your hand. I was a famous palm reader before coming here. Show me your hand and I'll tell you about your future when this camp is liberated. 
He said, what I see in your hand here, he said, you're going to be a leader in Europe. You're going to help with the unification of Europe at the end of the war. The next man, show me your hand. You're going to America to be a famous banker. And all of a sudden, these men, skin and bone, leapt out of the truck. Read my hand, read my hand, read my hand. And Desnos told them stories of what they would be and how they would do it after the war. Two weeks later, Auschwitz was liberated. The SS guards didn't know this, but they were bamboozled. They were totally put, they didn't know what to do. So they truck, they put them all back onto the truck. Sorry, they took them off the truck and put them back in the barracks. And the next day, they took them all back to work. They'd never seen raw energy like that. Why would we put these people in the gas chamber when we can use that energy? Two weeks later, it was liberated. The next year, Desnos died of typhus. But the palm readings he gave to those men did become leaders in America, did become leaders in Europe, did become famous bankers, economists. They fulfilled the role. Desnos told them where they were going at that extreme state where they were headed to the gas chamber, they took on a new persona. Wow. All of us here inspire our tribes. We've got tribe family. We've got tribe students. We've got tribe in our practice of the patients who come to see us. We're all leaders of tribes here, and we can inspire them simply. Judge. I won't mention his name. He's a judge in the Queensland Supreme Court. In 1983, the last mainland state, Queensland, brought in chiropractic legislation. As soon as that happened, chiropractors were given the privilege of working under the Workers' Compensation Act. We received a letter, and that letter said, you are now classified as a physiotherapist. Do you think I was happy? Not very happy. I've been the chairman of, I was vice president of the Chiropractic Association in Queensland. I've been chairman of the Workers' Compensation Committee, working with the Workers' Compensation Board prior to that. And I phoned the general manager, Jim Campbell, who was a very arrogant man. And I said, how do we change that, Jim? Bloody sue me. I said, well, what do we need to do? He said, change the act. I thought, costly business to employ a solicitor. So I said to him, how about I write to you and ask, would you have Crown Law write back to me and give me every section of the act that needs to be changed so we could be called chiropractors? He said, oh, I'd love to do it. I said, thank you, which he did. Probably saved thirty or $40,000 the government paid for. Then he engaged the barrister, took him to court. What happened? It took three months, judgment was reserved, we gained the qualification of the Workers' Compensation Board recognition as chiropractors. And the judge said, this is quite amazing. He said, there's actually no classification for physiotherapists. Under the Act, they're covered under wax bars, massage bars, and Turkish baths. But somewhere along the way, someone changed it. They shouldn't have. It's never been done by law, so I enacted that into the law as well. I didn't see any more of that till three months later. It's a Tuesday afternoon. I'm not working. I'm walking down Queen Street and Brisbane past the Supreme Court, and who should come out but the judge. I stopped, I went over and I said, Your Honour, John Hinwood, thank you for creating the category of chiropractors. He said, look, do you mind if we chat a moment? I said, I'd love to, but he didn't let my hand go. And then he put his other hand on top. And he said, let me share with you a story. He said, I was the oldest of nine children. My mother had nine children in ten years. She was active, huh? <laughs> Good vibrations. He said when she had the ninth child, they wouldn't let her out of hospital because she had cancer and she'd be dead in three weeks. He said my father took her out of hospital and all these people said, you need to go and see Mr. Shelby. Now Ernst Shelby was a chiropractor from Sweden who'd been practising in Sydney from about 1908 and the outbreak of World War I 
because he had a name of Ernst Shelbe, people started to attack him physically because they thought he was a German. So he moved to a place called Miller Miller. Now Miller Miller is up in the Atherton Tablelands in the middle of nowhere. And Ernst Shelbe went to Miller Miller and practiced. This is what Ernst Shelbe's practice in Miller Miller looked like. Beach view. Look at the tent camp here. He had hundreds of people turning up and he had to train a staff of people in the Shell Bay technique to work with those people. He said, I remember walking in there with my dad, all the kids, I was carrying the baby and he carried mother. My mother was 29. And Mr. Shell Bay said, I believe that your wife's body can heal and the work we do here can help her. But you'll need to leave her here. She'll need to live in because we'll need to attend to her several times a day in order for her body to respond and heal. Then the judge starts to cry. There are people going by, seeing the judge holding me, and I'm holding his, and he starts to cry. His vibrations were so going, I'm crying. We're both standing there bawling. And he's telling me the story of what happened. How his mother did recover in a matter of a few months. And how she only passed away last year at 89. She had, chiropractic gave her 60 more years of life. She got to bring up her children, got to meet her grandchildren, her great-grandchildren, and also some great-great-grandchildren. He said, chiropractic needs to be recognised. Thank you. So we hugged there, I don't know, for a bit of time. He went on his way and I went on my way. Look what Shelby did. Camps full of people, up in the back of nowhere in Queensland. He inspired who? His tribe, tribe chiropractic, and then the community at large. The last story. That's me on my third birthday. <laughs> now, on my, at this time, I became quite curious. I had a grandfather, my mother's father, who was a commercial artist. And beside his workbench was this picture. Pretty spunky looking dude of the times. Right? I used to ask him, who is that? He said, that's your great uncle, George Frederick Cook. And he and his brother, Albert, went to the First World War and were killed. And he, it's always stayed in my mind. We've been to, he found his grave at Brewery Orchard up near the French-Belgian border a few years ago. Now, here he is. He arrives at Gallipoli. He survives Gallipoli with his brother. They then go to the Dardanelles. They survive the Dardanelles. From there, they go to Egypt. Survived again. And now I moved on to the Western Front. When he went and en enlisted, why did men enlist in those days? Because said the war would be ended in six months. Have a holiday in Europe. Help God, King and Country. Off he went. And if you live in certain rural communities in Australia, you'll often find a half or a third of the young men in that community, or even fathers, were lost. We lived in a place called Upper Coomera for a while, and three quarters of the males in Upper Coomera died in the First World War. Then the Anzacs arrive in 1916 in France to join the British Army on the Western Front to defeat Germany. I have a collection of all the letters George and Albert wrote and sent back home to their brother Ernest. And the last letter is about how big his how was. He was a stretcher bearer. He wasn't, he was an infantry man. And they ran out of stretcher bearers. And his last letter to his brother said, Dear Ern, please don't give this letter to mother to read. It may worry her. 
He said, today, I volunteered to be a stretcher bearer because we need to go out there and bring our mates back who are injured, who are wounded. But please don't tell mother because this is going to be my hardest assignment because the average lifespan of a stretcher bearer here is 12 hours. He said, I'm doing this for God, king and country. I have to earn. May I ask, you think about what would you do for chiropractic if you were at that point in time? Would it mean that much you'd sacrifice your life and move forward? He finished his letter. It was collected from him as he sat in the trench before he was to go that evening. And a large piece of shrapnel came through the roof and killed him stone dead. The men either side of him, not harmed. But he was prepared to take the ultimate sacrifice for what he believed in. And how did he do it? He became a leader in his tribe. He inspired his tribe. Imagine how the men in the trench that night went out and fought. They lost their mate. He was going to go out there and bring people back. The wounded. So as we go through this weekend, if you can think, how are you going to become a leader in your tribe? How are you going to inspire your tribe, the tribe chiropractic, that you're a member of? I challenge you to go away from here being a better person and knowing the how you're going to inspire your tribe. Thank you. So say Thank you, John, for those amazing and inspirational stories.